So we move now to the last game, Western Eastern. So you were at this one and how all the dramatic ends. I, I did turn on for when you're like, you know, this is 84-81 with whatever. And yeah. It was like neither team wanted to win it, honestly. I, I have to talk about the, the finish, yeah, because I, at the 18-minute mark, I think Tom McGuan put them in front, and I thought this is the big storyline. You know, the Collingwood father-son has won the game for Western. They're going to defend. They're going to hold on. And then Easton get a goal back via Josh Smiley, and you think the storyline's going to be Josh Smiley, you know, absolutely dominates, kicks another one of those goals from stoppage. And then I think it was Javen Tanner for Western, and it looked like the storyline was going to be, you know, a no-name wins it for Western and someone who's oh, really... God, that's... <laughs> That's harsh. That's harsh, but someone that people aren't aren't as aware of, and and you know, is someone. I don't, and I mean that in the most endearing way possible. Like he's able to yeah, to yeah. build his reputation off this, and hopefully it propels him into some really good form. Yeah. And then the storyline becomes Ilaru Smith, who plays his best game for the season. His ruck craft was sensational. He got it to his teammates' advantage. He got a really crucial hit out to advantage to Josh Smiley earlier in the last quarter. And then, yeah, he was the one from 60 who finished it off. So, nice yeah, and, and his aggression uh, it was easily his best game that I've seen him play. I think he only was credited with four marks. At least three of them would have had to have been contested. So, yeah, it was a real presence around the ground. Got himself into some really smart positions as well. So I, I really liked his game. And if there was one player to, to finish it off, then, yeah, it was probably him. Well, you watched this game from a different lens this time. So you you looked at a few players and, and did a bit of a, you know, player focus in that sense on a few. So you've told me who I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna ask you about. Yep. I'm going to run through a few of these boys and you're going to give me a different insight because, you know, obviously we with the games we watch, we just kind of give our general yep. thoughts. But you, you've zoned in on a few boys. So one know quarter. Are, so one quarter. So yep. for everyone, so I've watched Jack Ryan closely in the first quarter, Cooper Trembath and Remy McLean in the second quarter, Xavier Kadachi in the third quarter, and Lockie MacArthur in the fourth quarter. So we'll start with Jack Ryan. Yeah. Tell me about his running patterns and generally how he found the footy. Yeah, so his running pa- I'll start with his running patterns. Uh, he, I-, I thought they were really, really smart. So corridor bias was what I noticed. He was running up and down the corridor, and what that meant was, A, he wasn't having to run as far. It's not like he was running on an arc. He was running in the quickest way possible to get to the line of the footy, and B, it meant that when he got the footy, he was getting it in dangerous positions, and he was able to really set his teammates up. The other thing about his running patterns that was really impressive was that he timed his run when he was getting to the fall of the ball at a marking contest really well so he was getting there with some speed he was getting there at the right time and then when he was clean he had some velocity and it was very hard to pin him down having said that when he was he was pressured and he was tackled he was able to stand up in the tackle we know he's played some senior footy for Rui Yellick and that really showed because he is able to still dispose of the footy the change of direction stuff from him as well was really good and I thought thought that that was a result of him being really light on his feet. So he found a fair bit of the footy in the first quarter, six or seven touches, and he spent 22 minutes and 45 seconds on the ground. In terms of how he found the footy, it was his ability to to present high and continue to offer tick leads, offer leads, and, yeah, get in the corridor, like I said. And not only that, but also when he did make an error, there was one time where he turned it over, but he his body language to stay involved, get involved at the next contest, allowed him to call was another turnover and then he got it in the middle of the ground and was able to release a teammate. So a really selfless game from him and I really liked what I saw because he was always able to get into dangerous positions and he was very smart. Cooper Trembath had the one-on-one with Keita Mattify Forbes and tell me a bit about his marking capacity in the end. That would have been a fun matchup to watch. Yeah, it was a fun matchup to watch. Unfortunately, I think the the quarter that I watched closely of Cooper Trembath was probably his least productive quarter. He was very good throughout the game. He took eight marks. A lot of those would have been intercepts, particularly in the second half, as we're used to seeing from him. In the second quarter, though, he was a little bit quieter. Keaton Mattify Forbes took a couple of marks on him, but what Cooper Trembath did really well is he never let... Keaton Martify Forbes get goal side of him and that meant that Keaton Martify Forbes yes we know he's got a long boot but he was kicking from 45-50 out so it's a lower percentage shot than it getting over the back he was, however, giving him a fair bit of room, and that's that allowed him to take uncontested marks and get those set shots. I think he kicked 1-1 from those set shots from, from memory, his direct opponent. Uh, and what the other thing that I noticed that he did really well was at times Keaton Martify Forbes got sucked into a contest Cooper Trembath held out, and then that allowed him to get involved on offense. That happened twice in the quarter, uh, and he also laid a smother as a result of him holding out. Um, and he was also in a position where if Weston had got the ball, he was going to be able to apply pressure, whereas Keaton Mattify Forbes sort of got himself in no man's land. So that's what I noticed from a positive point of view of Cooper Trembath. 
switch to the other end of the field and I want you to talk about this matchup and then and then the defender himself, Remy, Remy McLean and Lockie MacArthur. So tell me about Remy McLean's ability to move around his opponent, prov- provide, present a lead and the battle with Al Mack in the end and then touch on Al Mack and his performance and, you know, what he did without the footy in the last quarter. Yeah, yeah. So I start with Remy McLean. I thought what was really impressive, I watched Remy McLean's second quarter. So his ability to move his direct opponent, and it was often it was often Lockie MacArthur. It wasn't always Lockie MacArthur, but his ability to move him around was really impressive. And there was one time late in the second quarter where it was really evident. He was he had back shoulder on, on Lockie MacArthur. So he was at the back and the ball favoured Lockie MacArthur, but he was was able to work his way around his opponent. Now, he wasn't able to take the mark, but his ability to have the strength to work his way around and get to front position was really good when the ball wasn't kicked to his advantage. He took two really impressive marks in that second quarter, kicked the two behinds, but those two marks came in different ways. One was a hit-up lead, your, your general hit-up lead, and the other showed his acceleration and ability to get separation on the opponent. So I thought that was really, really impressive. As for the battle with Lockie MacArthur, he did himself a lot of favours, because he's clearly got predictable leading patterns. And that's really obvious when you watch him, you know where he's going to go. And it's also really obvious because Josh Smiley and Christian Moraes both targeted him targeted him multiple times. He was never outmarked when I was watching in that quarter. And they put it to space. They put it where he wanted it. They knew where he wanted it because they know how he plays because he's very predictable. In terms of Lockie MacArthur, in the last quarter, he had three touches. Unfortunately, two of the three were turnovers. But... And one of them did lead to a goal. So he, he that's that's an area that he'll be disappointed with. But what he did without the footy was really important. So he was a spare man behind the footy. And he he positioned himself really smartly, which prevented Easton from just hat kicking it forward because he would have intercept marked. Now, he didn't get the opportunity to do that because Easton... Eastern were able to chain it out via hands and they didn't go for that option, but he certainly closed it down with his smart positioning. Yes, that's obviously a coaching move to have a spare behind the ball, but it's incumbent on the player to get to the right positions and he did it really well. His ability to read the ball early allowed him to split a couple of really good one-on-one contests and his follow-up was really good as well. So I thought what he did without the footy and in a high pressure, high stakes last seven or eight minutes, he had some really important efforts. I really liked what I saw from him. Last one, Xavier Cardacci matched up on, you know, Easton's best midfielder at most of stoppages. So tell me about his involvement around the ground throughout the day and, yeah, that midfield craft he provided. Yeah, so I watched his third quarter really closely. There were nine centre bounces in that third quarter. There were lots of goals kicked. He went to seven of them. The two he didn't go to, he was playing forward and he's still learning that forward craft and that was really obvious. But of the seven centre bounces that he went to, for six of them, he was matched up on the best midfielder in there. And four of those, I believe, were Josh Smiley and two of those were Cody Anderson. Josh Smiley was off the ground when Cody Anderson was the best midfielder in there. So he's clearly the one that Weston look at as being the big body in there and having the most responsibility to do a role defensively. Yes, he, there are a couple of centre clearances to his direct opponent, but that's part of part and parcel of it when you're playing on Josh Smiley and you know, you've know you got Ilro Smith having the game of his life. They're going to connect. And I thought when the, other than those two times where they did connect... He did really well. He won a couple of centre clearances himself. He used his acceleration. His first couple of steps were really impressive when he did win centre clearance, and his stoppage craft was was really good as well. In terms of his involvement around the ground, he was able to work forward and present. He was unused, but he was still presenting an option, which was really good. It shows the increased fitness that we talk about, or we have heard Trent Dennis Lane and others talk about, uh, and he was able to go back as well. There are a couple of times where he made a couple of little errors, but was then able to mop up. A little bit similar to what I was saying with Jack Ryan, his ability to stay involved in the contest and not worry about what's just happened was what allowed him to thrive. 